I love farming. I love feeding people. I love the real work of putting my hands in the soil. My name's John Bocare Smith. I help run West Haven Farm. We've been farming since 1992. We're certified organic by NOFA New York and uh, pretty much have been from the beginning. We are primarily a CSA and farmer's market farm. Uh, we grow about 10 acres of vegetables and a couple acres of fruit trees. Here in upstate New York, it's a very concentrated, intense season, only taking up half the year. So I think that's one thing that's pushed us to try to extend the season with hoop houses, unheated hoop houses, also called high tunnels, as well as we have a heated greenhouse. So in addition to just extending the season, we also try to grow crops during the winter out of the heated greenhouse and uh, finding markets during the winter so that we can keep people busy through the winter months. Microgreens are a brassica mix, various types of mustards, cabbages, as well as things that make it interesting. Sorrel, basil, beets and chard, chrysanthemums. The microgreens are used primarily as a, a fancy salad. The local restaurants love them. It just takes a small amount on a plate to really dress it up. It's a fun product, you know, it's, it's, it's got this vibrancy and complexity. There's so many colors in, in one little spoonful. Microgreens have one set of true leaves, basically, is what we are shooting for. They've grown, they have their cotyledon leaves, they have one set of true leaves. Very small, you know, we're cutting them at a height of half an inch to maybe an inch and a half. We grow them in our heated greenhouse. We grow them in flats of soil. Depending on the variety and the time of year, it takes anywhere from two weeks to five weeks to grow that crop. We're constantly trying out new varieties. You know, some of the varieties we're, we're putting in the mix, we've determined are only good to grow during the summer months because they have a higher light and heat requirement. There's not a lot of information out there on growing microgreens. We just really had to just go with it and experiment. Uh, you know, we started on a small scale, uh, basically using the, the varieties that we already had uh, that we were planting in the field. I think there was a full year where we were just figuring it out. It's a constantly evolving system. The great thing about the microgreens is that it's a very fast turnaround. You have a very rapid learning curve with two to five weeks to grow a particular variety on, on a tray. The microgreens respond to a good potting mix. We've definitely discovered that. But they don't need a lot of it. So we've done a lot of experimentation with our potting mix and have the one that we like and we've determined the least amount of soil that they need because uh, soil is a very big expense. Soil and seeds our, uh, our major expense in growing the microgreens. We use very shallow trays, 10 row trays, that uh, have the least amount of soil. The day of seeding, it's very much of a two-person operation. One person has the Tupperware container with all of the individual seed varieties in them. They have the spreadsheet that we've pre-figured out how many trays of each type we want and that person takes out Dixie cups and measuring spoons and pulls out those varieties and scoops the proper amount into each Dixie cup. The person seeding the flats is basically using a, a shake method. Go up and down each of the 10 rows very quickly with a gentle shake of the cup, uh, trying to spread them out evenly across the flats. Most varieties don't require any additional soil on top. They are just left bare on the surface. We continue to experiment with uh, beets and chard are particularly problematic. They're beautiful in the mix, but they're more difficult to grow. The large irregular seeds tend to stick on the cotyledons even after they've grown up and it's time to cut them. Once the trays have been seeded, then they are lightly misted, which is the one time where we use a mister, a finer watering nozzle. 
So that takes a, a little bit of time. Our concern at that point is that we want to not disturb or wash seeds from one corner of the tray to another corner. We want to keep that nice even distribution. So we have to use a fine mister the first time. Since the seeds are sitting on the surface, we need to cover them over in some fashion. You need to keep them dark and moist for a few days to give them an opportunity to germinate. So we use empty, clean flats that we just turn upside down over them. So after a couple of days, you need to start checking under there, uncovering them as they start to germinate checking to see if they're drying out too much and, and need to be watered. Uh, occasionally you need to take all those covers off, water them, put the covers back on. There's a lot of variation there in how long until they've germinated. The brassicas, the mustards, they're going to germinate very quickly. Many of the others are going to take quite a bit longer. As soon as they've put down roots and they're starting to shoot up, you need to uncover them. If you miss that, if you wait an extra day, they'll get very lanky and more prone to having problems with rot. Rot is a major problem we have tried to manage. And I know in our first year, there were many times where we had to throw out whole batches because once there's a little bit of rot on a tray, it tends to spread. Particularly when you're growing through the winter and there's not a lot of light and not as much air circulation, it becomes really important to treat them well. You don't want them to get too lanky. You don't want them to dry out. You want to water them first thing in the morning. All things to try to keep them happy, try to keep them moist, but not dripping wet. Heat is really important for modifying the growth rate. We continue to experiment with heat to see how much air heat they need, how much bottom heat they need in order to grow well. In general, we want to minimally heat. Uh, we're trying to use as little fuel as possible. So we're keeping the air in the greenhouse uh, around 40 at night and uh, we're trying to keep the soil at about 50 in general but we we're, we continue to experiment with higher and lower temperatures uh, and we also when we realize that we've planted something too late or things aren't growing fast enough we'll try to maybe kick up the temperature a little bit uh, and vice versa when we have too much coming on we uh, we either move them to a cooler table or we change the temperature on that table we decide when to harvest based on how the crop looks. We're trying to cut when they have a first set of true leaves. So on harvest day, we come in with good quality scissors. It's very important. You know, we have a bit of a system about how we cut flats so that we're doing it efficiently. We're getting just the tops and not a lot of little stems. For the small seeded crops, our general technique is to hold the tray up almost vertical with one hand and using your scissors, you're doing this cut and flip motion in order to knock them into a holding tray below. For the beets and chards, we generally have to use a different technique. Uh, to be ergodynamic, we put the tray up on top of an upside down five gallon bucket to hold it up closer to eye height. And then we make sure we've removed all the seeds and hold the tops of the plants and cut with scissors and then inspect each handful, make sure that you know we, we don't have any roots that are sticking up and that we don't have any of those big seeds. It's very important as you're cutting to be looking at the flat, make sure that you're keeping a close eye out for any potential rot for any of those large beet and charred seeds. If that's what you're cutting, that's the best time for quality control to make sure you're only putting the best stuff into the lug. Once you've harvested, we dump the whole lug into the wash tub, make sure that it's well mixed, and uh, we do a triple rinse, three different wash tubs at that point to make sure that it's getting very clean. Let it dry a little more, maybe flip it, and then we can bag it up. Occasionally we'll bag it up right then, sometimes we'll put it in the cooler, loosely covered, and bag it in the morning. So we package up the microgreens into pound bags for restaurants and a variety of smaller sizes for farmer's market. And we've been experimenting with different bags and containers for that. 
I wouldn't say that microgreens is the magic bullet of all possible farm enterprises. You really have to look at your own markets uh, and the resources you have. For us, uh, we had an underutilized greenhouse space uh, that we we're looking to use more year round. Uh, we have a, a, a plethora of, of, of high end restaurants in the area that are really into local foods. Uh, so we knew that we had a built in market and so that we could go with that base and then uh, allow farmers market sales to maybe grow over time. Okay.